Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going through our series called uh, Misquoted, where we're looking at some of our favorite Bible verses, and we're seeing what they actually mean in the context around which they've been written. And we've seen sometimes they mean something completely different than we think they mean, and I think most of the times when we look at them in the context that either Jesus says them or the, the, the inspired authors wrote them is they're much deeper and much fuller uh, in, in our understanding of them. And this week is one of my favorite Bible verses. I, I can remember as a kid, this Bible verse was over the door of our house when we left to leave the house with a little plaque that had this Bible verse on it. And it's from Matthew chapter 19. And it's actually the words of Jesus, where it says, But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Have you heard that one before? The plaque on our door always said Matthew 19.26b, right? Not even the whole verse, but, but, with, but with God all things are possible. And and this is the verse that there's a probability that maybe you'll hear it on national TV this evening, right? Maybe, maybe, right? Some of you are laughing, but let me tell you the kind of, if you're going to watch the Super Bowl, right, there's a chance that the MVP of the Super Bowl is going to come on. He's done it before. Whoever it happens to be is going to stand up and say, you know, I first off want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I want all you kids out there to know that with God, all things are possible, right? Right? And if you just trust in God, then you can be the MVP of the Super Bowl, right? And if you're, if you're not into the Super Bowl, that's, that's okay. You know, chances are maybe you'll hear it next week when the Olympics are on, right? And you know, there will be this Olympic skier. She's just skied down the side of a mountain going like 80-something miles an hour, and she wins the gold medal for Team USA, right? And she's going to get crowned with that big Olympic gold medal around her neck, and she's just going to say, you know, I just want all those young skiers out there to know, those skiers on the bunny slope, right? That with God, all things are possible. Before you know it, you're going to be skiing down the side of a mountain. And while I I really, truly appreciate people who try to publicly witness their faith and and share about God, I, 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 I love that. But I think when we hear these things, or when we use this verse sometimes like this, we miss out on what Jesus is actually saying by it. Because this verse is a very, very deep verse. It's a very, very complex verse that's very much tied to the specific situation that's going around what's happening when Jesus actually says it. So what I want to do this morning is dig into that context in Matthew chapter 19. But to really understand Matthew chapter 19, you have to understand this section of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is is on his way to Jerusalem where he's going to suffer and die. And does anybody remember Matthew 18 from two weeks ago? Right, Matthew 18, anybody remember that? We looked at that two weeks ago. We started off with Matthew 18. The disciples were arguing about who, who was the greatest, right? And Jesus says, you guys are missing the boat. You got to humble yourself. The first will be last and the last will be first. And then, and then we talked about this idea of reconciliation when somebody sins against you, that you need to humbly go to them, seeking to gain your brother back, sort of this idea of humbleness and reconciliation. And then if, if you want to, you can open up your Bibles if you want to, where, where you jump to Matthew chapter 19 from that. And this idea of humility continues. The very first part of Matthew chapter 19, Jesus teaches about divorce But in the context of teaching about divorce, he he talks about these Pharisees, and he calls these Pharisees out that that think they know everything, and he calls them basically to humble themselves. And then right after we have this teaching about divorce, immediately following that, we have another one of my favorite sections of Scripture. It's when the little children are coming up to Jesus. And you remember what the disciples do when these little children are coming up to Jesus and their parents are bringing them up to be blessed by this rabbi Jesus? What do the disciples do? Go away, right? Send them away. Jesus doesn't have time for them. And Jesus pushes these humble little children, the disciples of Jesus, I should say, pushes these children away. But what does Jesus say? Yeah, he says, no. 
Absolutely. He says, let the little children come to me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, I don't I need to give you a, a, a cookie or something for that. That's good. <laughs> But, but yeah, that, that's exactly what, what Jesus says. No, the kingdom of heaven belongs to these little children. Let the little children come to me. It's all about this idea of being humble like a child. And then after the disciples shoved these children away, Jesus welcomes them back in. This is where we get the immediate context for our verse in the middle of Matthew chapter 19. And that's what I want to look at in more detail with you right now. So Matthew chapter 19 It says, and behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good, and if you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus says, well, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The man said to him, all of these I have kept. What do I still lack? So in the context, right, the disciples have just pushed the little children away. Jesus has said, let the little children come to me. And and then this man comes up to Jesus And he asked Jesus a very, very good question. He says, Jesus, what what do I have to do to have eternal life? What do do I have to do to be saved? Right? And Jesus says, what do the commandments say? And he says, well, which ones? You know, I've been a pretty, pretty good guy, right? And, And Jesus says, well, honor your father and your mother. Do not commit murder. Do not steal. Love your neighbor as yourself. Follow the Ten Commandments, basically. And the guy's like, you know, all of these I have kept, what do I still lack? And we find out a few verses later that this man that comes up, he's also extremely wealthy. Now, I want you to put yourself for just a second in the shoes of the disciples. You've just shoved the children away. Jesus has just rebuked you, said, no, let the little children come to me. And then this guy shows up. He's like the, the super Christian, the super follower of God. He's doing everything right, and he's rich, right? Who, who wouldn't want him to follow Jesus? I mean, maybe the treasury's looking a little low. You're saying, yeah, this guy's it. And he's asking, what do I need to do? Jesus, right? Use him as an example. Pat him on the back. Say, well done, good and faithful service. Come on in. Come into my band of disciples. Start following me and, and maybe start paying some of my bills, right? That's what the disciples are probably thinking. He's not like the little kid. Right, 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 right. Let this, little, let this guy come in. Tell him, well done, good and faithful servant. Right, but what does Jesus say to this man? This man thinking he's, he's gotten everything done. He's been perfect. He's followed the law. He's, he's checked all the boxes to be this super Christian. And then, then Jesus looks at him. And this is how Jesus responds. Right, the young man says to him, all of these I have kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus says to him, well, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So here, if you're in the shoes of the disciples, right, you're trying to... to, To help Jesus out, you you push the little children away. Jesus Jesus says, no, 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 let the little children come to me. And then when this super Christian, this guy that's supposed to be following God completely, who's rich, which was in those days known that you were blessed by God if you were rich. That's what they believed. Jesus looks at him and says, you know what? He gives him a very tailored answer. He says, if you truly want to enter the kingdom of heaven, sell all that you possess and give it to the poor. He tells him to do the one thing that he's clinging to that that Jesus knows he can't give up and this seemingly perfectly looking man leaves dejected. He leaves sort of with his tail between his legs. How are you feeling if you're a disciple? Right? Well, I, I think many of the disciples are probably saying, well, well what, what are you doing, Jesus? Like, we need him. Look, look how much money he has. Look, look how good he is. He's following the law completely. 
Why would you send them away? Because immediately when this man leaves, Jesus addresses the disciples. And this is what he says. He says to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. He basically tells the disciples who have just seen this man, this perfect man, leave dejected. He goes, yep, it is as you thought it was. Right? It is, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for that guy to enter the kingdom of God. He doesn't have what it takes. And then the disciples, they ask a very, very wonderful question of Jesus. They look at him in astonishment, I'm sure, and they say, well, well, well Jesus, who then can be saved? And I think that that's a good question. That, that's a question that, that goes throughout the ages. That's a question that, that we ask today. You know, if, if this if this perfect Christian, if this perfect follower of God or seemingly perfect on the surface can't be saved, well then who can, Jesus? It must be impossible if this guy can't make it. And I, I think we ask that question today, maybe not explicitly, but in our minds, in our thoughts, in our actions, we ask Jesus, who then can be saved? And I think there, there's two ways we kind of ask the question. The first way is very similar to us being the disciples. I think it's very tempting and very easy for us to, to, to look at the, the super Christians around us, right? Well, let's call her Susie Super Christian, right? I'm not thinking of anybody in particular, right? And they've got their faith all together, right? Every morning we, we open up our Facebook or our Instagram feeds and we see Susie Super Christian. She is there and she is tweeting up a storm with her devotional and her, her Bible. And we're like, man, I wish I could have a devotional life like that. And then a few years go by, right? And, and maybe it's been a few years since we've seen our friend Miss Susie Super Christian. And before we know it, we, we run into her at the store and say, well, how, how's your faith walk going? And she goes, you know what? I, I left the church a couple years ago. I'm kind of done with God. And we kind of say, what? You, you were on fire for the Lord. Right? And we say, if, if, if this super Christian can't do it, then what about us? Jesus, who then can be saved? Or maybe for you, you, you compare your, yourself or your, or your family to, to somebody else. Maybe, maybe you look at, at a married couple and you say, you know, I wish my marriage was like that. Or, or maybe you're, you're single and you say, man, I wish I could be married to somebody like that. Then my life would be perfect. Or maybe I wish my grandkids behaved like they, they behave. And then before you know it, that, that couple that you're looking up to say, yeah, if I could just be like them, my life and my faith would be perfect. What do you find out? That, that perfect marriage, that perfect couple, a couple months later goes through a pretty nasty divorce. And you with the disciples ask, well, well who then can be saved? If, if they can't get it done, who then can? Right? I, I see this with pastors all the time. Right, I'll be honest with you, there, there are pastors that I look up to, right? And these are like famous pastors, if, you can, if there's such a word as a famous pastor, right? And they, 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 they have podcasts and their YouTube channels have millions of followers on them and they write devotions and, and people read their blogs and millions, they're shared millions and millions of times. Right? And I'll be honest with you, I, I start listening to their sermons or, or reading some of their blogs or, or, or engaging with them online and, and just what they put out. I'm like, man, if only I could communicate like that, that would just be awesome. This guy's got it all going on. Right? And I can tell you most of the time, right, it's about a year or so that goes by and then something happens to them. Satan attacks. They have a bit of infidelity in their marriage. They have an abuse of power in their church. And before you know it, they're, they're making it, at least on the pastor blogosphere, they're, they're the, kind of the shame of the church. And in, in a year earlier, you're like, man, this is who you need to be. But then you're like, who then can be saved? 
I think we all have those people that we look up to in our faith, and when they, when they fail, when they sin, we say, well, if, if they can't do it, then, then who can? And sometimes, though the, the, the second way we, we, we're, we're like the disciples like this, we're like the rich man. Right? Sometimes we're, we're, we're thinking pretty good of ourselves. You know, I've done everything. I've followed the commandments. I go to church every Sunday. Jesus, just give me a pat on the back. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then we hear this small voice in our ear as we read the scriptures where Jesus is telling us to do something like sell all our possessions and give to the poor. Give up whatever we're clinging to most and, and start following him at a deeper level. And we say, no, Jesus. I'm sorry, I can't do that. And we leave kind of feeling forlorn and dejected. Well, well, who then can be saved? That's exactly what the disciples are feeling. The disciples are there. They've just seen this perfect so-called follower of God come up, and Jesus has said, no, 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 you don't have enough. And the disciples are there with us saying, who then can be saved. It must be impossible. And to those feelings, to that feeling of dejection that, that we're not good enough, that we'll never be able to do enough, that it's impossible, listen to what Jesus says at the very next verse in Matthew 19, 26. It says, But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Jesus does the impossible. And if we look at this verse in the context of what's around it, this is at the end of Matthew chapter 19, then we have Matthew chapter 20, and in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is going into Jerusalem to do the impossible he goes into Jerusalem and he ultimately, a week later, he hangs on the cross and he suffers and he dies. And I'm, I'm sure the disciples are, are looking at Jesus as he's dead, as they lock themselves in an upper room. They say, you know, we, we thought maybe Jesus could do it, but now he's dead. This way of following God and salvation, it, it must be impossible but then they find out firsthand on Easter morning as the women run to the tomb and they send back reports that, that Jesus is alive and as Jesus appears to them in that upper room with his hands and his feet pierced and they put their hands in the holes of his arms and his legs and his side. They see that with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Jesus has done the impossible he has won our salvation and bought our salvation for us. And that's what this verse is all about. It's all about salvation. So if you're going through life feeling dejected, man, I, I can't do it. Man, I, 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 I can't. It, it's impossible. I, I just fail and I fail and I fail and I try. I, I can't meet the standard. Well, hear the words of Jesus. With man, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Jesus has done the impossible for you. He has conquered death. He has conquered your sin. And he has brought you to the Father, perfect in the Father's eyes, as he's paid the penalty for your sin. He's taken a camel and put it through the eye of a needle for you so that you can know you are saved. So stop comparing yourself to other people. Stop feeling dejected, but rather rest and trust in Jesus and his forgiveness and grace, knowing that Christ has done the impossible for you. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.